I firmly stand by that I had my own dogman experience when I was 18 years old, a senior in high school, around my house, probably a couple of miles away, no more. My girlfriend and I would go back into the woods, rolling hills with white oak and fir trees sparsely populated throughout. The scenery was beautiful. In fact, me and my girlfriend would both go back there into the woods to make out. Her and I had both been bitten by the nature bug, so it's somewhere we really loved to spend our time. And because I grew up in a small town, there really wasn't a lot to do, especially to escape our parents and friends, who constantly wanted to suffocate us with their time. So when we had this dogman experience, it was an afternoon like any other. Nice and sunny, clear day, probably in the upper 70s. It was later April, or maybe early May. I was a senior, and going to be graduating in probably five or six weeks, whenever the graduation was. I think it was early June, somewhere around there. My girlfriend was a junior, with the weather being so clear and sunny and bright. I know for a fact, there is no possible chance for a mistaken identity of a bear. I've seen black bear many times around here. I've seen black bear tracks many times. I know what a black bear looks like. This was by no means a black bear, even though some friends that I've told this story to really don't buy what I saw. But anyway, my girlfriend and I are sitting there, under this old half-dead tree, just talking, probably lost in conversation, when I look up behind her and I see this tall, dark figure coming in our direction from one of the hills a ways away. I was a bit startled, because in that first couple seconds, I thought somebody else had wandered back here, and where we were, to my knowledge, nobody really comes back here for any reason. Because we're such a small town, we didn't really have homeless issues, so there wasn't any bums or anything back here, or addicts. But as I finished those thoughts within a couple seconds, my brain was able to fully process a little more what I was looking at, and I realized, after no more than two seconds flat, frozen in conversation, this was not a person at all. It was far too tall. It was clearly bipedal, and having a large dog or wolf head, with two tall German Shepherd-like ears, very black in color, and kind of fuzzy, especially around the neck and head, kind of like a mane, the way a German Shepherd does, its body being much more slender, but still lean. My brain was able to process all of this within just about four seconds, when I told my girlfriend, look at that, what kind of animal is that? She turns and gasps, as this thing now drops down to all fours, and is now running in our direction. I think instinctually, we just reacted. She screamed, I yelled, and we both just got up and ran, ran back towards the direction of my house. We were sitting on the hill, facing downwards, south. My house was up north, behind us, up the hill. This thing was coming from the west, heading directly towards us, or perpendicular. So going north, this thing would have had to have turned up the hill to chase us. But it didn't. When we ran up the hill, neither her or I turned around to see if it was following us, and by the time we got to the top of the hill, we lost sight of it. We were both freaked out, panting, and decided to stop and make our way back to the house once we made sure that it wasn't following us and it was clear. I have never seen any animal that walks bipedally and then so effortlessly and naturally drop down on all fours like I watched this thing do. When this thing first appeared over the hill to our west, it was probably, if I had to say, no more than a hundred feet away. So I know for a fact it definitely saw us. It was facing our direction. I'd say it walked maybe 20-30 feet, and then seamlessly dropped down to all fours, like it changed its entire structure and bone position, and then began sprinting at incredibly fast speeds. That's one of the reasons why we booked it. By the time we had gotten up the hill, it was gone. So it either dove down into the hill, where trees are more far and few in between, which would translate to less places for this thing to hide. Or, it ran to the thicker area of forest, which was to our left, or to our east. I'm not exactly sure where it went, and how we did not see it. So, either two things. We either hallucinated it, 
or it was incredibly fast and disappeared into the thick brush. Since my girlfriend and I both saw it, both gave the same description and account of what happened. I really don't think we just randomly hallucinated something like this happening. We did not end up telling my parents or any of my friends at first, and probably not until a few years later, once her and I would both be in college, did we actually open up about what we saw, which would have made it the early 2000s, where the whole concept of the Beast of Bray Road and Dogman in general would be a little more popularized. That's actually kind of how I found out that it was a Dogman. Her and I also never heard any sounds of it approaching, no sounds of it stepping on the ground, and even once it dropped down to all fours, there was no sounds produced by that either, by it running, thudding, or moving. It's like it was completely silent, which is incredibly eerie. Having not seen it up close, I couldn't tell you any details about its face, but going on Google or online and looking at many depictions of what people illustrate as a dogman, it's not too far off from that, except it wasn't built like a big bodybuilder or like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It was pretty slender, but still lean, more tall and lanky than anything else, with the head from far away, just like that of a black German shepherd or a wolf. And no, I did not see any eyes or any teeth. Being in the late 90s, you didn't really talk about this kind of stuff anyway, for fear of ridicule. Once my girlfriend and I graduated high school and moved into college together, we would break up and both of us moved to different parts of the country. We stayed in contact because we were still best friends. And even now to this day, we each have our own families. I live on the West Coast and she still lives in the Midwest. We still talk about it from time to time and how scary it was. I know for a fact they are indeed real creatures. But as far as what are they, where they came from, and what do they act like or eat, I couldn't answer any of those. When I was around 12, my dad rented out a cabin that belonged to his friend from work. It was deep in the wilderness, accessible only by a dirt road. I wasn't really excited about going, but I decided not to let in on it. I didn't want to upset my dad. Dad was an outdoorsman. From a young age, Grandpa, his dad, would take him out hunting, fishing, all that stuff. He figured he would take me along to share those same experiences. It didn't matter to Dad that I was a girl. Dad packed some essentials, but was planning on buying certain things we needed along the way. He was told there was a general store some ten miles away from the cabin. So, we would buy stuff like firewood, milk, bread, whatever else we might need. Apparently, there wasn't any electricity in the cabin, so we would have to heat it with our fireplace. Dad even packed his twenty-two Winchester rifle and a little revolver. I figured we would go hunting at some point. I'd actually never shot a gun before, but Dad said it wasn't that hard and that we could easily practice. He said the hard part was hitting something. We headed out on a Thursday and planned to be back the following week. I fell asleep for most of the ride, and when I woke up, we were at the general store. At that point, it was night. Dad bought what he had needed, and we headed off for the cabin. The dirt road leading to the cabin was pitch black, and despite the headlights, you could only make out a few feet in front of you. Dad drove really carefully to avoid any bumps or big rocks that could easily mess up the tires. The path was way overgrown. Tree branches were sliding along the car. I tried to look out into the forest, but I couldn't make out anything. When we got to the cabin, Dad fished out a couple of flashlights. It was dark at night and freezing outside. We unloaded everything from the car and brought it in. The cabin was pretty small. There were two cots to sleep in, a wood cook stove, fireplace, cabinets with plates and tin cups, and a bench, and plenty of spiderwebs. It looked like the cabin hadn't been used in years. It totally creeped me out, but Dad loved it. 
said it felt more rustic. We put everything in its place, and then went to bed. Dad asked me if I wanted to bring the cots outside to get a good look at the stars. I said no. He chuckled. We both went to sleep. The first few days were pretty nice. We hung out, woke up early, and cooked breakfast. I hiked around the area. Dad taught me how to make a fire. He showed me how to use a compass in case I ever got lost. We even shot the guns at some of the trees. I felt pretty ready for hunting, but Dad thought I needed some more practice before we went. And we needed a license, but he didn't care about that. Dad even offered me my first beer, and I'll never forget that bitter taste, the warm feeling in my stomach. Afterward, we would drag the bench in the cabin outside, set up the empty bottles, and do some more shooting practice. Even though I wasn't excited about the first trip, I ended up loving it. Dad was usually always working, so it was the first time we actually spent time together in a very long time. At night, we would make s'mores, and Dad would tell me stories from when he was a kid. First loves, bullies, pranks, that he and his buddies would pull. After the first three days, even though I was nervous about it, I wanted to show Dad how tough I was by taking my cot outside to sleep. Dad joined me, and we would both try to see if we could see a shooting star. That once creepy forest began to become something beautiful. One night, I could not sleep, neither could my father. Despite being deep in the wild, we never really saw or heard any wildlife. Insects, yeah, but never deer or squirrels. Dad was worried about attracting bear, so he made sure our food was secure whenever we went out hiking. But we never saw anything. Since we both could not sleep, he suggested we get the flashlights and hike for a bit, tire ourselves out. Maybe that would help us get to sleep. At this point, I wasn't scared of the night, so I was up for it. Though Dad suggested we bring the rifle and the twenty-two. And just to be on the safe side, in case we ran into something less than friendly. I jumped out of the cot, eager to head out. Dad reminded me to stay close, so we don't lose one another. I put the twenty two around the waistband of my pants. Dad joked to be careful not to shoot myself. My dad swung the strap of the rifle around his shoulder securely, flashlight in hand. I followed closely with a flashlight of my own. We decided to hike to a little creek we had found. It was only about 30 minutes away, and then returned back, figuring that the hour-round trip would be more than enough. When we got to the creek, there was a horrible smell coming from nearby. I had never smelt something so awful. It didn't take long to figure out what it was. A few feet away from us was a deer, its body mutilated, guts spilt, and its face was torn. This made my father nervous. He suspected a bear must have done this. We began to head back, my dad staying in front of me. The twenty-two felt cold against my stomach. I shined the light everywhere to see if a bear was following us. I bumped into dad, and he had stopped. I was going to ask him why he stopped, but he shushed me. His flashlight was pointed at an animal, a bear. It had its back to us, eating a deer. It hadn't noticed us yet, focused on its meal. Dad motioned to me move slowly, and we began to move around the animal. A stick had broken underneath my foot, and the bear flung itself around. That's when I realized it wasn't a bear. Its face was like a dog's, glowing from the light. It had looked like a bear because of it was being hunched over. Now, the animal stood up on its hind legs, taller than the two of us put together. It was wild and mangy, long hair, long arms, long legs. The animal began to step toward us, snarling, angry, Dad took out the rifle, firing three shots into the air. 
This startled the animal. It dropped down on all fours and ducked into the brush. Dad and I ran back to the cabin, gathered as many of our things as we could, and drove back home, right then and there. To this day, I have never seen anything like it again. As I got older, whenever Dad and I would talk about what we had seen, Dad was sure that what we saw was a bear, and that the flashlights and the shadows made it look bigger than what it actually was. Personally, I'm not convinced, and I don't think he is either. What do you think? Do you think we saw something other than a bear? I've always loved Halloween. In some ways, I even prefer it to even Thanksgiving or Christmas. There's something about the dressing up, the anticipation of the night, the little undercurrent of mischief and malice that just makes it fun for me. Plus, I've always been a huge fan of scary movies, so the whole aesthetic is a bit more than tinsel and holly. Many moons ago, when my children were young, I would spend weeks on their costumes. Not as a chore, but because I just loved it. I would ask them well in advance what they wanted to be for trick or treat, and rather than bowling an outfit from the store, I would custom make their costumes. I was always sure to add little details that would make them very special, different, and unique. One time, my oldest son, Peter, wanted to go as Freddy Krueger. I'm not sure where he saw the image, because I had certainly never let him watch those movies. But he was obsessed with the idea. So I did what I could. I used an old gardening glove, cut plastic cuts from an old two-liter bottle to make the gloves in a way that wouldn't be dangerous. I used wax paper and plastic wrap to make a mask for him, the way it would look like scars. But now, my kids have long since grown up, moved away with families of their own. I still look forward to trick or treat, and I volunteer as a neighborhood watch guard in our own little community. My home is truly in the suburbs where most people know each other and are well aware that on trick or treat night, they should expect groups of kids to be going door to door in costumes looking to score large amounts of candy. But, of course, that doesn't make it 100% safe. There's always the random out-of-towner who will come speeding through, or even rowdy teenagers, who might use Halloween as an opportunity. You do read about this stuff, and see it on the news. My job is to take up one of several posts that the Neighborhood Watch Committee decides on and to just stand guard. Watching the kids walk through the streets, making sure first that they are safe, and second, that they don't cause any mischief. Basically, I set myself up with my own bucket of candy at the checkpoint, and I watch for a few hours. I actually love the job, as it gives me the chance to see all the different costumes the kids and their parents have designed and to still be right there in the thick of fun, even though my own are long gone. Enough of the backstory, because last year, something changed for me. Now, I know that the first thing people are going to say about my story is costume. I'm standing in a street where for hours, I've been surrounded by every manner of ghost, demon, devil, and hobgoblin imaginable. Latex. Fake hair, even bedsheets, are all around the place that I didn't bat a single eyelid. They'll say that what I saw was clearly just another kid in a suit or a mask, or perhaps a parent, as keen to get in on the action as I was. This is what people say. But, as history has proven, people are wrong. It was nearly 9 p.m. I had hung on, as I always do, to check for any stragglers or kids who had, for some reason, got to a late start. But I hadn't seen any for at least 20 minutes. The last group, featuring an adorable little girl, dressed as a pumpkin, had been accompanied by their father. So I just decided to call it quits 
and head home. But, just as I reached over to fold up my camping chair, I caught sight of this figure standing at the edge of the street. At first, the whole thing was just a silhouette in the streetlight. I wondered if my eyes were playing tricks on me, but they weren't. It was there, plain as day, and huge. When I say huge, I mean it. This was no kid. It must have been well over seven feet tall. And that was the stooping over. It had huge thick arms, human-like, but covered in hair. But it was the head that got me the most. It was the shape of a dog. And even in the darkness, I could see long, sharp teeth protruding from its snout. I just spent the whole night looking in every variety of mask under the sun. And I'm telling you, this was not a mask. What I saw very closely resembled a werewolf, or some kind of dogman creature, whatever you want to call it. It was real, and I was face to face looking at it. I stopped packing up my things, looked around, trying to estimate how quickly I could get to the nearest house, whether it be quicker to run behind a tree and hope it had not spotted me. I watched as it lowered its head toward the ground, padded slowly toward the bushes on the far side of the road. After the trees, there are fields, and then it's out onto prairies. I stayed perfectly still, and prayed as the thing slowly moved off and disappeared into the leaves. This year, I will still be doing my job on the neighborhood watch. More than ever, there needs to be somebody out there looking for the kids, to protect them. I will stand in that same spot. But this year, as well as a bucket of candy, I'll be taking a can of mace, just to be sure. Back in May of 2002, in Blacksburg, Virginia, I bought my first house a little over a year ago. I had been living in an apartment for years, basically my entire adult life. I was really looking forward to having a house with a yard, being able to garden, and have campfires. I live in a medium-sized city in Virginia, not far from the Blue Ridge Mountains, so I have the usual urban advantages, but I'm not far from nature either. The house I bought was in a smaller suburb on the edge of the city, and my house backed up against a small forest and creek. Not far away was a much larger forested area. I had a good-sized yard, partially fenced in, and lots of privacy. One of my first goals was to get the backyard all set up. I wanted to host a cookout for my friends as soon as I could. Within weeks of moving in, I began working on the yard. I took care of mowing and weed whacking, and then did some simple gardening. Nothing fancy. I bought an umbrella table and some chairs, and also a few camping chairs for the fire. Then, I got to work, digging a fire pit. Once it was in decent shape, I invited friends and coworkers over for a cookout. We roasted hot dogs over the fire, had some drinks, and hung out virtually all night. It was exactly what I had hoped for. I cleaned up the food after everybody went home but left everything else out until morning. The next day, I went out to finish cleaning and was stunned. My backyard was in ruins. The table and chairs had been flipped over, tossed around. There was garbage strewn all throughout over the yard and shredded up. There were deep furrows in the grass, and the little flower beds I'd planted were now visibly trampled. I took pictures then began cleaning up. I was able to save the furniture, although it was pretty banged up. There wasn't much I could do about the track marks in the grass, though. I sent the pictures to my parents and some friends, asking them what might have caused this type of damage. Based on the chewed-up garbage, I just assumed raccoons, but the flipped furniture was definitely the work of something larger. And with the long scratch marks in the ground, had to be made by something with big claws. 
as far as I knew. We didn't have any bears out here, or wolves. Coyotes were my best guess, although it seemed like really odd behavior. No one I asked had any better answer either. I was assuming that the smell of the food was what had attracted the animals, so I did not have another cookout for a while. Instead, I worked on fixing up the fence. A little over half of it was already fenced in, so I got someone to install the additional sections to finish it up. The contractor also shored up the older sections, made sure all of it was sturdy enough to keep any animals out. A few months after the first cookout, I was feeling better, decided to invite friends over again. Just like before, we had made hot dogs and hamburgers, sat around the fire, listening to music. Between 11 and midnight, most of my guests filtered out. One friend stayed behind me to help me clean up. He knew about the mess last time and was concerned, which was actually nice. We pulled all the food and drinks and garbage inside. I folded up the camping chairs, cleaned everything up as best as I could. I felt a lot better with the fence, but still being cautious. Once it was all done, my friend left. I made sure the backyard light was on and locked up. I tried going to bed, but I was having a hard time falling asleep. Since I lived alone, it was a little freaky thinking of a pack of coyotes, or whatever animal, prowling around my house. I knew I was safe inside. I still felt nervous. After an hour or so, I was almost asleep when I heard the sounds. It was a splintering sound, like cracking wood. It was enough to completely wake me up. My bedroom window looked out over the backyard, so I walked over and looked out. The light was still on, but everything beyond it was in the dark. I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary and wasn't sure where the noise had come from. I stayed there, watching, waiting. Eventually, I saw movement. Right at the edge of the light, something dark was moving around, checking out the backyard. It was big, but I couldn't see much more than that. I was too scared to go downstairs for a better look, but was confused as to how it had gotten in the yard. Apparently, it could climb fences. The thing moved around some more. I heard it snipping around the fire pit, then moving closer to the table. As it did, I can now see it more clearly. Having thick, dark fur, I was beginning to think I had been wrong. Not a coyote or a raccoon. This was a big bear. I was looking down on it, and the thing was hunched over oddly, so I couldn't see all of its body very well. Then, as I watched, it stood up. It straightened up and stood very tall on two legs. When it turned its head, I could see that it had a long, narrow snout. The head of this thing was shaped much more like a dog than a bear. Also, now that it was standing up, I could see that the legs were too long, and the torso too slender to be a bear. I had no idea what I was looking at. Suddenly, it turned and lifted its head to look right at me. I was standing in a dark room. It couldn't possibly see me, but it stared straight at me for several long minutes. Its gold eyes appeared to be glowing in the darkness. I felt hypnotized looking back at it, until I snapped out of its stare, jumped back from the window. I threw myself into bed and hid under the covers all night, like a child, not sleeping once. The next morning, I went outside to check out everything, saw that part of my fence had been knocked over. Apparently, this dogman werewolf creature had somehow pulled it down to get into my yard. Needless to say, I stopped having cookouts after that, instead of dealing with whatever that thing was. For the majority of my life, I've primarily lived in the panhandle of Florida, all the way from Jacksonville to Tallahassee, and everywhere in between. 
I don't venture much to South Florida or even Central. Too hot. And I prefer the northern climate. We still get a bit of the southern hospitality and the swampiness. There's just something about it that I really enjoy. Not to mention, avoiding the majority of all the hurricanes. Even though being up here, you're still at risk. Anyway, one night, I believe I saw something that I can't quite explain. That I don't feel really fits the description of what many would claim would be a Bigfoot. Right around my house is a lot of thick swamps. And I was driving home one night, probably around 7 p.m. The sun was near setting, so there was still a little bit of light outside. As I turned a corner, this figure had its back towards me, and all I saw was hair. I don't think it was standing upright at first, or at least not all the way, because as I came around the corner and my headlights lit it up, it turned and almost kind of twisted its whole body to meet my oncoming car, with the headlights illuminating its face. The first thing I noticed was that it most certainly wasn't a deer and how ugly it was, but in just a couple of seconds, my eyes would go down to see what it had in its arms. It looked to me like it was putting a deer in a headlock, and then I realized this thing had hands, like a person, but with long black claws at the end of each finger. This thing had apparently snapped the neck of a deer and was holding its limp neck in its hand. As my eyes went back up to meet this thing, it had a very ugly face. Think of like a mix between a dog and a monkey or a bat. Very short snouted, but very much like a dog. Just really ugly. Maybe not like a short snouted dog, like a pug. Think more like a wolf or German shepherd, but a much shorter snout, with lots of sharp teeth protruding, and much uglier, like the eyes were sunken in. It looked kind of creepy looking, and then my eyes went back down to it holding or hiding its deer, and then it quickly turned its back again, as if to hide what it had. But at this point, I had just driven past it. All this happened, what I described to you, in a matter of probably five seconds as I approached it. It was the creepiest thing ever. This was no more than probably three miles away from my house. The entire road is surrounded by bald cypress trees. Spanish moss growing everywhere. This thing, creature, animal, call it whatever you want, was right between the trees and the road. I'm not sure why it appeared to be trying to hide the fact that it killed a deer and was holding it by its broken neck, all while acting like it was hiding what it was doing. Like it was trying to do something in secret. I'm still not sure. I've lived here, again, for most of my life, and I have never seen anything like it. Come to think of it, though, I've had friends who claim they've seen the skunk ape, and I've never seen or heard that either. I've seen everything that Florida pretty much has to offer, and much of the South, as far as wildlife goes. This was a first for me. This experience marks the very last time I ever went on any road trip, or drove out of state, and did not get a hotel at least. I regret this decision. So, to set the story up, about 10 years ago, I drove about three states over to go see some extended family that I haven't seen in at least 20 years. Well, instead of flying and being cheap, I decided just to drive there. To save as much money as possible, I would just pull over to spots that I knew were safe and nap in the car. Even though I could have gotten a cheap motel, I figured the 70-80 bucks was worth saving at least at the time. I regret that now. For me also, I decided to try and skim through the traffic, taking back roads whenever possible, which wouldn't you be surprised, with the way I had to go, there were actually more back roads to take than I would have liked. Plus, I enjoyed the scenery, so somewhere on the trip there, after consuming my three or four cups of coffee throughout the entire day, I had reached my limit, found a nice little pullout on a not-too-traversed road, and out I went. The next thing I know, the next thing I know, I'm awakened by something banging against the window. It jolts me awake, since I'm a pretty light sleeper. 
I wake up, look to my left, and to my horror, there's this large hand pressed up against my driver's side window, and then my eyes immediately dart over to the illumination of light not too far away, where my eyes then make out the silhouette of what appeared to be an incredibly large head of a lion, and then my eyes adjusted more. Then I see it appeared to be a giant dog head, but with a large mane, and my mind immediately went to the movie Dog Soldiers, which, if you haven't seen it, was a great werewolf movie. My mind, trying to process all of this, is trying to think of, what is this thing? Is this a lion? Is this a wolf? Is this a werewolf? And all while this is going on, and my eyes are continuously adjusting to the darkness, and my brain is scrambling trying to adjust, this thing is just staring into me, into my very soul. I could see its eyes. I could actually see very tiny pinpoint pupils, and its eyes were emitting this very soft red warm glow, as if they had lights in them. It was very unnatural. Do you know how when headlights illuminate an animal's eyes, and they kind of have that glow? Well, it wasn't like that. It looked fake almost, like a Hollywood prop. Like I said, kind of like a Christmas bulb, as if the eyes themselves illuminated a warm, red, soft glow. But it was incredibly scary looking, and the face was frightening. It was kind of like half man, half wolf, at least in the upper part of the face. It had a huge snout and lots of very long teeth. Far too many teeth for its mouth, actually. It just sat there, still, like a statue, and just kept grinning at me. A very sadistic, terrifying grin, with its hand firmly pressed against the glass. I'm completely frozen in shock and terror, looking into the eyes of this thing. And I could see that its hand on the window is so incredibly large, it takes up at least half the window. Imagine like an eight to nine foot tall person and how large their hand must be. Just imagine that for a moment. Or I don't know if you've ever been to a Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, but I'll never forget. They had this one exhibit, or a fake prop, of this man that used to live a long time ago. I believe he was like nine or ten feet tall. Anyway, massive human being, but I'll never forget how big his body parts were. His head, his hands, they were like that, completely enormous. After maybe ten more seconds of staying perfectly still and staring me down, this thing just very slowly backed away while never breaking eye contact, slowly fading into the darkness. And I was left there, terrified, petrified. In fact, I don't even think I can move for the next couple moments. Quickly, once I regained some sort of conscious thought, I grabbed my keys, fumbling, jamming them into the ignition, and driving out of there so quick. In fact, I was so pumped full of adrenaline, I probably went another two whole hours onto a main highway, pulling off and getting a motel, just so I can try and get some sound sleep. Although, I don't remember getting much sleep at all that night. That was terrifying, and from that point onward, I pretty much just stayed on the major interstates, and only pulled off to motels or hotels when I could. The state that this happened in was a very rural part of Oklahoma. I truly believe that dogmen have moved into the area on my property and have driven out the small family of Bigfoot that have lived here for well over 20 years. My house and my entire family has been around the entire Umatilla area in eastern Oregon for almost all of our lives, at least as far back as I can remember. I inherited this property from my family and have lived here myself for a very long time even having my own kids being raised here. It wasn't too long after we moved in that we discovered a very small, friendly family of Bigfoot that lived on the far back side of the property, since our place does border the Umatilla Forest. They sometimes come for food, which we set out, things like apples, bread, other miscellaneous things that they find amusing and eat. We've always made it a point to respect them, leave them gifts, and just ultimately leave them alone. They usually come through the area around spring and summer, and then fall and winter. They're not around. 
or at least not that we've taken notice to. They've been here, as far as we know, for about the past 15, 16 years. We would notice a large male, probably 8 to 9 feet, very broad like a linebacker, a much smaller, shorter female, and a juvenile. We've never gotten good looks up close to either of them, but we've seen them at a distance, and with the gifts we leave out for them, we place in the middle of our property, safe, away from our house, so they feel they can get to it. Our gifts are always taken, so that's good. They've always kept to themselves, never try to harm us, or come into our house, or bang on our windows. Anything of ill intent, like many Bigfoot stories would tell you, but our family is also very respectful of their space and property. In fact, even my kids growing up always played at different parts, and never in the area of the woods where they were, just out of sheer respect. But, in the last couple years, we haven't seen them, even in the spring and summertime when they come up. Instead, we've been seeing something else entirely, something we believe to be a dogman after having done some cryptid research and finding out exactly what it is we've been dealing with. My youngest son, who is at home right now due to the virus, has been doing some backwards exploring and has seen this same creature many times. I want to make a quick note that my first sighting of this black large wolf creature was about early 2019, March or April, right around when this family should start showing up. But instead, we saw this. And the first thing we also noticed was the incredibly low population of deer. Around this area, there are so many whitetails, it's not even funny. But around this time, we noticed much of them had left the area. We thought that was odd. This is a great place for them to breed, to live, and to eat. So seeing this large, upright, black walking wolf from far away was a little alarming. And I knew something wasn't right. The spring and summer of 2019 became very unnerving to be outside. I remember many days in May and June when I was out back doing yard work on the far end of the property. I would get this awful feeling that I never got with the Bigfoots around. Just this intense feeling of being not even watched, but almost preyed upon, like you're being stalked by a bear or a large predator. It made me feel very uncomfortable. This feeling followed very well into the summer, even into late August, where it got so bad that I would just neglect doing yard work out there altogether because I didn't want to deal with it. In the fall time, around October, when things started to cool down, I could go back out there and not have any issues. This went well into winter, and then, when the virus came, around March of 2020, things escalated. My youngest son was now home full-time from his studies, and decided to do a lot of outdoor exploring, not believing that there was a large black wolf back there, since he didn't believe me, and still believed that there was the Bigfoot family. After going back there, multiple times all throughout April and May, he told me he had several sightings of his own of this large black upright creature, and said there were actually several, and what he believed to be an actual pack of them. After venturing about two or three miles back, he found many deer carcasses, which he explained were unusually eaten up and torn into pieces, as if a large ravenous predator had gotten to them. And there was also a shortage in wildlife. Not much deer around. Not much of really anything around. No signs or tracks of really much. As if something had driven almost all the wildlife out of the area. Even the birds. It was incredibly eerie. At first, he had spotted large canine tracks of incredible proportions. And after spending more time going further back, on several different occasions... He spotted a pack of these things, alternating between going on two and four legs. And being far away enough, he felt safe and secure that he wasn't spotted, but said upon immediate sighting, he felt so much fear and terror that he retreated. That wasn't the first time. As I explained to you just a few paragraphs ago, he had seen them multiple times all throughout the spring and summer, ranging from the very back side of our property to farther into the woods. Although I gotta hand it to my son, 
He's pretty fearless, even though these encounters have shaken him up. He still goes back there, wanting to see them, admire them from a distance, and I think just a complete wanting to understand them, understand what they are. But one thing is for certain, we have no doubts about what they are. They have to be dogmen. I mean, they fit every description that we've looked online. And might I add that their heads are completely oversized, massive, and disproportionate. Come the fall of 2020, they also disappeared. And now, with it becoming March, we're starting to see some activity again. Just last week, my son saw one of these things approaching the house, and then suddenly seemed to disappear. This was in the early morning hours as he was making his cup of coffee, and the sun was rising. Said he saw its large body approaching the house, and then when he looked back, it was gone. He said he's now starting to worry that these things are going to be coming up to the house and trying to get in. I'll try and keep you up to date if anything crazy happens. Thank you. My boyfriend thought I needed some fresh air. I have never really been a fan of the great outdoors, but he insisted on taking me to his family's cabin in Michigan for a Thanksgiving weekend getaway. No crazy shopping or internet access. It would just be him and I for three days, surrounded by the woods. I figured at least we would be inside and not in a tent. The family was traditional and held on to the place for over 50 years, or something like that, so there was still no working plumbing or electricity in the actual cabin. When we arrived late Thanksgiving night, we had to light all the candles immediately and get a fire going. We also had to use an outhouse, so I avoided drinking anything on the drive up. I was so full of dinner, but I did not want to wash anything down. I wasn't searching for an outhouse that I had never been in in the dark. Once things warmed up a bit, we set up in a bed in front of the fire and talked for a while. We were both finishing up midterms in our final year at college, and we had plans to move in together. I was so excited, talking about furniture and a new car with him. I completely overlooked his pouring me more and more champagne. As we neared about one in the morning, he told me he was so tired from eating and driving that he was going to step outside to use the restroom, then go to sleep. As he stood up, it hit me all at once. I had to use the bathroom too. Lucky for him, he could just step out front. But I didn't have that luxury. I was forced to bundle up and head to the back of the cabin. As I prepared to walk out, I told him I was very nervous. He just laughed it off and went on about how he had come up there his whole life, never had a bad encounter with any animal. I paused and asked him about a person. He looked at me like I was crazy, reminded me how far from other people we actually were. That didn't make me feel much better, but he tried. I was hoping he would come with me, but I knew he had done so much that day. I didn't want to bother him. I wanted to show him that I was going to enjoy this trip. I walked around the cabin to the back with a flashlight. I turned it on, and as soon as I stepped outside, I held it directly in front of me. I didn't realize that I should have probably pointed it down so I wouldn't trip. I walked slowly enough as the small wooden outhouse appeared under a half-lit moon. It wasn't terribly far. I turned back, just to see how far it was when my foot caught on a branch. I found myself face first in the snow. The flashlight jumped from my hand and off to the side. I was left with only the moon. I began to pick myself up from the ground when I heard it. It sounded like a rabid dog growling. My eyes caught a glimpse of two hairy claws, the size of my head, standing only three feet from me. I didn't want to look up any further, but like a train wreck, I felt compelled to. I moved up from the claws to what looked like a dog's hind legs. 
my first thought was a wolf, getting ready to pounce, until I realized just how enormous the legs were. This was bigger than my boyfriend. Up past the waist, my eyes kept going as I noticed the shape grow more human-like. It was still covered in fur. Its arms were muscular, and it almost did not have a neck. Then, I saw the face. I could not believe what I was seeing. The face of a wolf, but much larger. And its eyes were more like a person's than a canine. Its features were dark, but I could see that its snout was more pushed in than a dog's or a wolf's. It wasn't cute or beautiful like a dog or a wolf either. It was hideous. There was drool all around its mouth, and I had to look up really high to catch all of it, making whatever it was about eight feet tall. I was sure I was going to die. Out of pure fear and adrenaline, I picked up a wad of snow and launched it at the thing. I scrambled to my feet quickly and started running back to the cabin, screaming, hoping my boyfriend would hear me. I didn't even look back to see if it was following me. My boyfriend met me outside, obviously genuinely concerned. He looked down to see me all wet with snow. I just kept crying about a wolf or dogman in the woods, and how I couldn't even make it to the outhouse. He grabbed my hand, walked me back to where I fell to see if it was still there. There was nothing, but I picked up the flashlight and pointed at the footprints that it left in the snow. They led back into the woods. I showed him I wasn't crazy. He took the flashlight, kissed me, pushing me towards the outhouse. After I used the bathroom, I was afraid to walk out. I didn't know if that thing would come back. Instead, it was just my boyfriend, reaching for my hand to walk me back inside. He said he thought it was just my imagination getting the best of me, but I know what I saw, and I had showed him the footprints to prove it. After a night of virtually no sleep, I begged him to take us back home. We spent our weekend together at my apartment, where we began planning the wedding. I had him sell the cabin. A couple of weeks ago, I saw something. Even now, I don't know how to think or feel about it. I come from a town that is close to the mountains, so wildlife is common. It's an everyday thing there. Bear, deer, and coyote would come down to the neighborhoods to search through trash cans or just roam around the streets. We would even see mountain lions, but that was rare. Around wintertime, though, more than any other animal, you would see the coyotes. You would never see more than two at a time, and generally, they were never a threat. As long as you waved your arms and yelled, it was enough to scare them off. During the winter, I would feed my dogs early so I could walk them sooner, before it got too dark, usually around seven at night. I wanted to avoid other people who might also be walking their pets. My dogs weren't exactly the most behaved or well-trained, especially when they're around other dogs or people. They would almost always make a scene, like barking or trying to lunge at other dogs if they were close. It would be a little embarrassing, so to avoid any hassle, I tried to avoid people whenever possible or situations would present themselves. Also, as a precaution, I would carry a stun gun that I had bought. No reason other than to have some protection. I never had to use it, and hoped that I never would. This particular night, I was headed back home with my dogs. Typically, I would walk around the block once or twice, and on this night, one of my dogs was constantly turning to look at something. When I would turn to look too, I saw nothing. Any noise would usually grab their curiosity, but I just needed to call their name, and they would continue walking. The street was wide, lined with parked cars, with a few streetlights. But it can get pretty dark on the street. Visibility 
sometimes totally non-existent. While my dogs were sniffing around by a tree, I saw something behind a van parked across the street, peeking its head over the top from the other side. When I noticed it, it retracted back quickly, but then peeked its head out again. It was another dog checking us out. It appeared to look like a German Shepherd, dark hair with a long snout. Definitely was not a coyote. They were typically light gray and thin. Figuring it had run away or even gotten lost, I tried calling it over to see if it had a collar. When I tried calling for it, the dog retreated back. I kept calling for it, but it stayed hidden behind the van. I was sure it couldn't be too far from the owner, so they'd probably be searching for it. I gave up, decided to continue walking home, but one of my dogs continued to glance back to where we had seen the dog. As I was walking, I began thinking, something was different. The thing that really stuck with me was its eyes. They were bright yellow. I figured maybe it was just a mixed breed. Maybe part wolf. That's when my dogs stopped again to sniff. I looked up, saw the same dog again, hidden behind some closer cars, peering around the back bumper. I tried to see if I could get it to come to me, but instead, it began growling, exposing an over amount of razor-sharp teeth. My dogs noticed it and began whimpering and crying, clearly scared. This thing slowly moved from behind the van and slunk towards me. Being much bigger than I thought, I was still having a hard time seeing clearly because it was still hidden by the shadows. I was getting nervous. This dog thing was getting hostile. I took out my taser, let out a couple of buzzes, which usually works with coyotes. It did stop for a split second, but didn't appear deterred. It continued walking in my direction. I began waving my arms around, screaming, and trying to make myself big, the same way you do to stop a bear. Just then, it stood up on its hind legs. It was not a dog at all. It was massive, easily eight feet tall, and began walking towards me. I couldn't move. Every instinct was telling me to run and to get away, but I was petrified by the huge animal in front of me. It was not a dog. It was not a human either. It had the body of a man, but the head of a dog with a wolf-like face, and I could see all those teeth even more. The creature stared at me and did not flinch as it moved, stealth-like towards me. Its eyes now were glowing red, and its mouth was fully open, fully exposing all three-inch fangs, filling its mouth like a crocodile. My dogs were going crazy. Just then, headlights coming down the street toward us. This creature took one look at the lights and jumped down on all fours, disappeared behind an alley. The people in the car did not see what I saw. The driver could tell I was distressed, as well as my dogs. He asked if I was okay, but I could not get the words out. I just nodded my head up and down. They told me not to stay out too late, warning me there are wild animals that come down from the mountains. Then he drove off. It took me a little while to regain my composure, and then I ran home. Since that night, I've made it a habit to walk my dogs only on my street, or I keep them in my front yard, but never after dark. When I think back on it, something that bothered me the most was its mouth, its exposed fangs. When the headlights reached the dog, and for a brief second when I got a good look at it, it appeared to almost have a human expression, like it was happy or smiling at me, like it was enjoying going to get me. That fear will never leave me. I was dealing with something that was potentially far more intelligent than any animal. Just this last fall, in October of 2020, whatever it is I encountered, a dogman 
or werewolf or were-man. I must have really pissed it off. For starters, every year, my father and I always stick up large salt blocks for the deer around here. We get a lot, especially some pretty good four and five pointer bucks. It never fails. This last fall though, we barely saw any, and I'm not sure why. That is, until we ran into this thing. On the far back side of our land, my father has several different deer stands set up, each one pointing over to a different direction, all about a half mile apart. I'm not sure which one he was in, but I guess he got a good sight on a four-pointer, went to fire, and saw it taken down by this large, what my father described to me as an Anubis-looking being. Anubis being like the Egyptian gods, human, except having a very stark, sharp-featured dog head, covered in black, with incredibly large hands and claws, on the feet and hands. It scared my father so much that he retreated from his deer stand and came back up to the house, it told me exactly what happened. Not even a couple of hours later, this thing came stalking up the tree line, watching the couple does that were at the salt block. We could see it clear as day. It looked very menacing, very aggravated. Maybe it thought we were competing for its food, or so that's what I take it as. It appeared to back away after a short time, and we left it as is. That evening, it tried coming up to the house, where my father shot at it with his forty-five multiple times, and I believe he hit it right in the chest as it came running towards our house, on two legs, the same way a person would if they were running. My father, just like me, is a shoot now, ask questions later kind of guy. We're not really concerned with what it is or where it came from, but is it hostile? Is it coming to attack us or trying to take our life? That's all we really need to know before we fire a few shots at it. And while the entire situation is very scary, our lives are more important than asking questions. We shot at it, didn't seem to do much damage, even though this thing was clearly hit with a 45. There was also no blood, which was strange. We haven't seen it since. And within a couple of days of that happening, there was no more deer, and we haven't seen any, not even does, for the rest of the season, even up until now, the beginning of March. It's extremely unusual not to even see one. We've gone looking around, and there have been no traces, not even deer sheddings. Usually, by the winter and fall, this place is packed full of dough. We even set up a few game cams right outside the salt block. Nothing. It's a little strange what's going on. We're beginning to suspect that whatever this Anubis wolf creature was has ran off or eaten all the deer in the area. Thankfully, it hasn't tried to break into our house or attack us anymore. The last time we saw it was in October when it tried to attack me and my father. Maybe we've driven it off, and maybe it's taken all the deer in the area with it. Oklahoma City, in the beginning of summer of 2020. I believe that I saw a dogman pup. This ain't scary. It's just, at the time this happened, I had never heard of dogmen. Anyway, I'm a homeless drug addict, and the reason I'm telling you this is the reason I was walking out early that day is because I had to go meet my supplier. I say 6 a.m. the morning, and I was walking next to a large turnpike. I was about 700 yards away from my destination, where I was walking, and I could not see the cars passing by because of the way the turnpike was built. There was a drop down to the road itself. At the bottom was the roadway. Up at the top, it has a fence, and the fence is setting on top of a cement divider, and is played out like this, until you reach the off-ramp. I'm telling you this because that's where I seen the dogman pup. I was getting closer to my destination. I was looking slightly down at the turnpike, and looking off to nothing as I come up to this part in the drums into the off-ramp. This big-headed puppy was pulling itself up to this hole in the fence. I'm assuming it made the hole for easy access. 
I say easy, because if you run straight across the street, there is a strip mall with a couple of restaurants that if you go in the alley, that's where they keep the trash. And I can assure you, that's where it was heading. I mean the hole comes right out across from the opening of the alley. Now, where I seen it, I was walking and thinking all of a sudden, I was just looking at this big-headed puppy. I mean, big-headed wolf pup. I think it's a pup, because it looked like a young dog or wolf. You know how you can tell a dog looks like a puppy, or a young dog, or a dog that's getting older? It was pulling itself up to the side of the cement wall, where the fence is. Sitting there is a big hole in the fence. It was in the middle of the hole. His front two paws was up on the wall pulling itself up. You know how when you pull yourself up on the side of a swimming pool, like it was part of the way up, and I just happened to look and see it, and I was like, oh man. I mean, it looks so smart, like it's got a lot of intelligence. It didn't look mean. It looked surprised. I could tell it was thinking, oh man, now I'm spotted. We'll look for a second, never blinking or anything as my eyes came back to where the pup was. It was now gone. That's what happened at the time, and I had never heard of dogmen. I had heard of Bigfoot, but no other kind of creature. And I just happened to be on YouTube, and I started listening to a few different channels where I heard a story about this creature. Then I began remembering that big-headed puppy I seen that morning, and it was like, dang... It looks funny with such a big head and little body. It ain't the scariest, but it's really big and not too tall. I remember it having blue eyes. Very smart looking. It was gray. Really thick looking fur with white tips all over it. I didn't see its teeth or its mouth since it was closed. Its ears were like on the top of its head, like a pit bull's when they're cut with like just a couple of curls of fur on the tip of them. I couldn't see the bottom half of it, but its front paws looked like they had long nails, like claws, that were being used like hands. And by the way, the way it was lifting its hands up on the wall and itself, it looked so surprised that it could not believe that it got caught. I believe it was going to the trash can in the alley that had the restaurant trash. As soon as it pulled itself up all the way, it just had crossed the lanes of road and be in the alley, not being that big of a risk. It had about 30 minutes of darkness left to go through the trash. Anyway, sorry if this was back and forth. I never really sat down and wrote a statement out, so I apologize. But I hope you've gotten the gist of my story. It's been a few Novembers since this happened but it's still terrifying all the same. Even typing it out still brings back really bad memories, but I feel it's an important story to share and really disproves the notion growing up that monsters don't exist because what my friend and I saw that night is something out of a Stephen King novel. Right before this happened, a very close family friend who I've been friends with for a very long time and still am close, her boyfriend of six years cheated on her and then dumped her, not only being emotionally distraught, but she was really needing company and did not want to be alone. Since I was free for the weekend and didn't have any plans, I offered to come stay at her place for the weekend. It would keep her mind occupied and keep her spirits high. I showed up, and we had a little bit of a girls' night, watching movies, eating popcorn, and just doing anything we could to keep her mind off her ex-boyfriend. Because of her not having the greatest finances in the world, she ended up with this little podunk place, kind of on the outskirts of town. A lot of woods around, but still very pretty, on the outside. It wasn't like it was run down or anything, just very small. But it was just her living there, when her ex would occasionally visit her when they were together. So what else more could you need? Since I was staying the weekend, about 11 or maybe midnight, my phone was down to about 9 or 10% battery, and I realized, oh crap, I left my charger and closed in the car. Going out to my car to retrieve them and all my stuff, since I was staying the weekend, 
is right when I saw what looked to be, or appeared to be, a werewolf. I stepped out on her front porch, clicked the unlock button, and as soon as I was doing this in unison, the front porch light and my car lit up together at the same time, illuminating the entire area, which, right before I clicked the button and before opening the door, was pitch black. As soon as both lights came on, I was screaming and startled by what I saw. Standing maybe six feet behind my car, approaching the house, was this really tall wolf figure. Instantly, I felt like I was in slow motion, like my brain was scrambling to try and make sense of what it was intaking visually. I was seeing, right in front of me, the most realistic werewolf costume I had ever seen in my life. But as it was moving, and I could see its muscles working under its skin, and the way it was breathing, and coming towards me. This was something straight out of a movie, or a Stephen King novel, which I would know. I've read a lot of his books growing up. I love him as an author. That's why he's the first thing I thought of when I saw this, or I believe the book is Silver Bullet, about werewolves. I was screaming, turned around, went back in the house, and locked the door. Now, as I'm coming back in the house, fumbling with my keys, trying to lock the door, my friend who's curious, but also now panicked, rushes to the window to see what's wrong. Then she begins screaming as she starts asking me, what is that thing out there? And sees it too. That's when she closes the blinds and we both run and dive into the kitchen, grab the largest knife she has and sit there, huddled together, crying. Within a minute, we hear this thing walk like a man would on two legs to the back door where her sliding glass door is. Luckily, that had blinds on it too, and it was very aggressively trying to open the door, as if it knew what handles were. So that means this was clearly a person in a costume, the most convincing one I'd ever seen, or we were dealing with a real-life monster. It was rattling the door very hard, and then maybe after 10 or 15 seconds gave up, paced around the house a couple of more times, trying to pound on the windows, not heavily, because I believe if it wanted to, this thing possessed the strength to shatter a window. But it was like trying to find a weak point into the house, trying to get in. At one point, it wiggled the door handle, the front door, very violently, as if hoping it would release. It never did. We went through a period of time where we didn't hear it at all, but still too worried to get up from the kitchen floor. We decided to stay put, still crying, still scared. The only sound being the outside and the TV faintly going. About 12 minutes go by. I do remember this because I was looking right at the clock on the oven, which was right next to us on the floor, and perfectly visible. We heard a couple very loudly distinct pops. It sounded like something being blown up, or a large balloon popping. Two of them, actually, and then silence. We heard nothing. Eventually, my friend and I fell asleep, huddled next to each other, knives still in our hand. I was the first to wake up. I jolted my friend awake, telling her, We made it. It's morning. The light's coming out. It was about 7.45, maybe 8 a.m. at this point. It's almost winter, so the sun is kind of late on rising, especially up here in the north. My phone was now dead, and because I had an Android and she had an iPhone, I had no choice but to go and grab my charger. I was going to figure something out, and could not let my friends stay here. She didn't have a car at the time, and she mainly got rides back and forth. As I went out to my car, I realized something horrifying. Even though the sun was up, and I was now no longer afraid to go into the darkness, my two back tires on my Prius were completely flat. I was horrified. I walked over to check them out. It looked as if somebody had slashed them, and upon looking closer, something large had bit into them, popping them. There were huge holes in both the back tires, and they were completely flat, and I had already used my spare and never replaced it about a year or two ago before this. To make a long story short, I ended up calling a tow truck. I had the guy give me his personal opinion on what happened. He told me, you either have a very aggressive bear 
that bit these back tires, or you ran over some spikes. Something happened. Anyway, I took my friend with me back to my place, where she stayed for the next two weeks, before returning back to her house, only for a couple of days, before going to stay with her family for a couple of months, and then permanently moving up there. She eventually went back down, but only a day or two to collect her belongings, never staying overnight. Whatever happened that night, we don't talk about it. I wish I knew more about what it was that we saw, this woolly, hairy, shaggy, wolf-looking thing. But unfortunately, I'm not a biologist. Thank you for taking the time to read my encounter. I hope it's provided at least entertainment, if anything, even if it is at me and my friend's expense.